Advertised as an arc for the atomic age, Vault 96 was never what it seemed. From the moment the vault door closed, its residents, five specially chosen scientists, discovered the truth. Their mission was not one of ecological rebalancing, but genetic experimentation, inflicting increasingly dangerous mutations on the unfortunate creatures housed within the vault. But the greatest secret remained a mystery even to them. In Cryogenics Bay 86, locked behind military access controls, a single cryopod housed specimen X001. Accessed only by the vault's automated systems, its genetic samples exhibited a transference capability and were used to create a unique shifting mutation. All attempts to identify what the specimen was failed. No vitals, no measurements, no source data. Only an ID number. So, what is specimen X001? In today's video, we're going to explore two theories to try and answer this question. Going back through the events that took place in Vault 96, presenting evidence for and against each theory, as well as investigating some potential links between the mutated creatures from Vault 96 and the mutated enemies we actually face in Daily Ops, before finishing with the revelation that a third party might be linked to both, and is actually still active somewhere. Let's get started. Following in the footsteps of the sinister Dr. Blackburn, we arrive at Vault 96 on the heels of Blood Eagles, seeking to pillage and loot everything they can find. Although the questline will direct us to terminals, notes and entries left by Blackburn, to begin our investigation we need to go back in time, instead focusing on the older holotapes and terminals left by the vault's original occupants. We learn from the mainframe terminal that the vault's construction finished in August 2077, and to the public was advertised as an arc for the atomic age, one of the largest cryogenic storage facilities in the world, with approximately 10,000 animals preserved within it. However, despite its size, only five human residents would be granted respite from the Armageddon, and these five were specially picked for their roles. Highly gifted individuals, each was a leading figure in a particular field of science or robotics. We can learn the most about their personalities and background from the database found on the Overseer's terminal. And the first scientist was Eric DeMarcos. Selected for the role of Overseer, he was the senior professor at vault -Tec University, and importantly, the chief developer of the vault -Tec Emergency Management System overseeing the database of protocols that would be used in all vaults. Jeanette Higgins had quite the CV before taking up the role of Chief Robotics Technician, the lead developer of the Assaultron robot while at Robco, and a lecturer for the Department of Robotics at the Commonwealth Institute of Technology. This is also a good time to mention that our visual representations are purely fictional. The third resident was Chief Engineer Hans Memling. The oldest resident of Vault 96, he was an expert in the field of quantum, nuclear and cryogenic engineering. And last but definitely not least, we have Nina Vallea and Molly Cooper. Both had worked together and begun a relationship with each other while at Chromax Genetics. Molly would take up the position of Chief Biologist and Nina as the Chief Researcher. But this is where the public missive and the roles of these five would take a turn. Because once the vault door had closed behind them, the new overseer Eric DeMarcus must have been taken aback by what he found on his terminal. We find the Vault 96 protocol as expected, however this is all a lie. A second protocol was released automatically upon the ceiling and a lot of it completely counteracts the first. The purpose of Vault 96 is to conduct genetic experiments, to explore potential mutations that may arise in post-nuclear fauna and develop appropriate countermeasures. So, a different primary directive, but reading on, residents will not be permitted to introduce native or genetically modified species outside the vault, a complete contradiction to reintroducing species. Not only were all five residents lied to, but they would need to reach weekly quotas or suffer termination by the vault's robot security. The biggest kicker is the revelation that only the Overseer would ever be permitted to leave. I think, however, the most interesting line in this section is results will be transmitted via satellite to external facilities for analysis and deployment. I will come back to this at the end of the video, as I think it's the first hint that a different faction was, or perhaps still is, actually linked to the discoveries that were made in Vault 96. The final entry is our first mention of Cryogenic Bay 86. For the Overseer's eyes only, the entry explains that if any resident of the vault was to tamper, disable, remove, or destroy security seals on Cryogenic Bay 86, then it would actually also result in the immediate termination of all life within the vault. Automated research systems could be used to retrieve genetic samples from the bay, but it also mentions that these samples should be considered extremely hazardous and handled with all possible caution. No mention yet of Specimen X001, but there are some interesting details here. But returning to the story, the news of the protocol amendment 
wasn't well received by the four other residents when the overseer broke the news. You will all have weekly research quotas to meet. And if we refuse? Or fall short? Anyone failing to meet their quota, or otherwise trying to rebel, will be... eliminated. You can't be serious! Molly and Nina were clearly the most busy, with the remaining team members essentially filling the role of support staff. Listening to a series of genetics logs found in the research wing, we learned that by week 100 things had been getting hectic. Our first mutations were simple enough. Venom, regeneration, electrogenesis, natural phenomena with well understood biochemical processes. But I fear we have set the bar too high. Eric's quotas are ever more aggressive, even as potential research targets grow increasingly elusive. Molly and I have moved on to more speculative mutations. Chameleonization, pyrokinesis, cryokinesis. But after that, I am less certain. Already Nina was worrying about the quotas, but it's important to pause here and take stock, because by this point they had already developed a sizable list of mutations. In the next log, everything is about to change, with the introduction of the first genetic sample of specimen X001. I confess, I was skeptical when Molly showed me her analysis. There was little to work with, given its a uh, unique biology. As an initial bench test, I spliced each of our extant stable mutations into separate samples. They all worked, flawlessly, as if we had spent months adapting them. And then the mutations... Uh, spread. They somehow shifted from one sealed petri dish to the next until all the samples exhibited all of the mutations. Fascinating. I wanted to proceed to live subject testing immediately, but all of our attempts to resuscitate a specimen have been blocked. Hans is looking into it. In the meantime, this transference capability merits further investigation. I've let this one play out in full because I think it's arguably the most important information available for both theories. Checking the engineering workstation again, we actually learn what Hans was able to discover. He decided to take his own inventory and discover that actually there are 85 cryogenic bays. Except at the back of Bay 85, there's a door, tungsten plated, military access controls, top of the line stuff. And when he looked through the grating, it was just a single room, all concrete except with one cryopod. And inside, he could have sworn he saw something move. The final genetics log is actually Nina's last. If I could study the original specimen, perhaps I could make some progress. I have put everything into this research. I'm out of time. I will not make my quota. Oh, forgive me, Molly. Unable to meet the quota and despite the best efforts of the other team members, an assault drum brutally killed her, blasting her head off in front of the rest of the team. I won't go through all the details of how their story ends, but the death of a team member kicks Eric into action. Attempting to insert the Seraph virus in the mainframe succeeds, but unfortunately none of them live to see it. With all living occupants dead and the vault critically damaged, the entire space freezes over and the door unseals, allowing mutated creatures to escape and prompting the vault to begin activating the emergency management system to call for assistance. Dr. Blackburn would then discover it first, bringing Hellcat mercenaries with him, followed by the Blood Eagles and then us. The story is over, but it's now time to reflect on everything we learned. The genetic material from Specimen X001 exhibited two unique qualities. First is the transference capability. Six mutations were developed prior to its introduction. A sample of each extant mutation was then spliced with the new genetic material, separated in six sealed petri dishes. But, despite being separated, each sample would then go on to exhibit all of the mutations, somehow transferring to the sealed petri dishes. The second quality, which might be an extension of the first, appeared once live subject testing began. Checking the biology workstation logs, the new shifting mutation was tested on our bloke fly. After successfully shifting twice as an evasive maneuver, it reappeared inside the torso of the opposing creature, causing immediate death. Final detail on the aftermath of the failed shifting was the fusion of both subjects' bodies on a molecular level, creating an indistinguishable mass of flesh. Nina corroborates this, that the subjects would shift or phase once stressed, but without access to the original source, it would be impossible to fine-tune the mutation. Ink taken in conjunction with the initial findings about the specimen, The cellular structure is unlike anything I've ever seen. I ran it through the DNA sequencer twice, but pff, nothing, nothing at all. And the military protection, access codes, and threat of immediate death if tampered with, then it's safe to assume that this specimen was of alien origin. 
Which brings us nicely to the first theory. Specimen X001 is a Flatwoods monster. The only creature we can currently encounter in game that has the ability to teleport and is a natural comparison to the shifting mutation. A local legend, these aliens move around by hovering above the ground, firing purple energy blasts once they've entered combat. Not only do they have the ability to teleport, however, their controlling ability affects every non-player character entity in this game. It's also no secret at this point, but killing a Flatwoods monster and entering camera mode, or looking at any image of its helmet removed, that this creature is a malformed Zetan. I say malformed because inside the bullet-shaped carapace, tiny legs can actually be seen. How could vault Tech have acquired one, though? Well, pretty easily considering that they probably weren't working alone. The Enclave Research Facility has a room containing three dead Zetans, and the military access codes protecting Specimen X001 suggests that pre-war military or the Enclave themselves may have been working with vault Tech. So, it fits, right? Case closed. Except, there's a couple of things that I'm not sure do fit. The Flatwood Sponsor, to me, is a highly advanced battlesuit operated by a single malformed Zetan. From our experience in the Fallout titles, the Zetan's technology is exponentially more advanced than ours, and this is where they get their power. From science and technology. When separated from their technology, they don't really pose much of a threat. The Flatwoods monster ability to travel hinges on the thrusters that propel the suit. But where do its abilities come from? Is the teleportation possible because of the suit? Or is this type of Zetan essentially a mutant, with its abilities tied to the genetic makeup naturally or through augmentation? If its abilities are tied to its genetics, then absolutely I think that this theory does fit nicely. I'm genuinely split on this, so definitely let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. But the second theory is even more speculative, so get your tinfoil hats ready, as this is essentially one big easter egg. There is an alien in a Bethesda game with a unique biology, the ability to change its structure at will, and possesses a wide range of different abilities that seem awfully similar. Most of all, however, the ability to shift and mimic matter. Specimen X001 is a species of Typhon. Hostile aliens encountered on Talos 1 and Arcane Studios Prey. Straight off the bat, this would qualify as an easter egg. If we were ever to discover for sure what the specimen was, it won't be this. But let's talk about why Typhon is potentially a better fit and what it is. Attempts to contain and research the shiny, shimmering grey-black aliens on the Talos 1 space station and Pythias moon base would ultimately fail leading to the setting of the main game. But that research taken in conjunction with the various species you encounter in Prey paints a pretty clear picture. They are incomprehensibly alien, made up of solids, liquids and gases all at once, with their sizes and shapes varying greatly. The various species possess a wide range of abilities. Listing them off, let's see if any of them sound familiar. Mimicking matter, telekinesis, teleportation, i.e. quickly phasing or warping to a nearby location, generating fire, electricity, corrosive gas, mind control, remote machine control, psychic assault, or even creating new species of Typhon. The species that exhibits the closest thing to the shifting mutation is the Phantom. Created from human corpses, these move rapidly fast and are extremely dangerous. However, if heavily damaged, the Phantoms can shift away from the player to a safe distance. But furthermore, a weaker form of the ability can be installed as a neuromod by the player character, and it's called Phantom Shift. The terminology here I think is quite important. When you face off against a Flatwoods monster, I've found that their teleporting isn't normally a result of fear or damage taken, but is actually a conscious effort to close a distance or gain a tactical advantage. A fun fact about the Flatwoods monster too, but if it manages to keep sight of you, it will chase you across the map. I've dragged one before from the mire to a distant location in the Savage Divide for a video. This isn't a creature that scares easily or is at a disadvantage. The Phantoms from Prey technically do not teleport either. They cannot move through solid walls in the vast majority of cases, and a better given description for what they do is phasing. So far, shifting and phasing are both words used to describe the effects of using Specimen X001's genetic material. To finish up with this theory, the other nugget I think is the mimicking matter. They can completely change their molecular structure in certain situations. The mimic variants can camouflage themselves as inanimate objects, but can also split themselves into multiple versions of themselves. A potential parallel to the mutation spreading from one sealed petri dish to another, and the end result of the shifting mutated bloatfly actually merging with its opponent. But now it's time to summarise both. The Flatbus monster theory without a doubt holds more weight. It's an in-game entity, and if this mystery was ever to be officially revealed, then I have no doubt it will be this. The Zetans feature heavily in Appalachia, so continuing down that path would make sense. I do think that some of the details don't perfectly line up though. But if this mystery does remain one, then I do think it is a possibility that it could be an easter egg for Typhon. 
Some aspects I think line up better and I have no doubt that 76 will end with unsolved mysteries that were never answered. There are so many loose ends to wrap up so I'm sure we won't get answers to them all. Let me know what you think though down in the comments about these two theories or if you have any of your own, I'd love to hear them. To close out today's video, I wanted to talk briefly about some similarities tied to Daily Ops and that faction who may be involved in some way. By the time the research has finished in Vault 96, using specimen X001's genetic material, a total of seven different mutations have been tested. Venom, regeneration, electrogenesis, communionization, pyrokinesis, cryokinesis, and the unstable shifting mutation. One of the main features of Daily Ops is also mutations, of course, and pairing some of these up, there are quite a few matches. Active camouflage is communionization, freezing touch is cryokinesis, Group regeneration is regeneration, toxic blood is venom, and volatile is pyrokinesis. The notable point with this last one, in the biology log, implementing the pyrokinesis mutation on a wolf resulted in it exploding rather than gaining fire-based attacks. And we know two other things as well. Upon the collapse of the vault, animals began escaping, and more importantly, all data research from Vault 96 was being transmitted to an external site which leads nicely into the, my theory as to where this data was actually going. I don't think it's a coincidence that player-based mutation serums can be purchased from Modus in the Enclave Bunker, because there is no faction seemingly more invested in mutation research and aliens than the Enclave. And what do we know about Vault 96? It included a secret section containing Specimen X001, protected by military access controls. The Enclave Research Bunker, of course, also contains dead Zetans as well. So, my theory is the Enclave partnered with vault -Tech with regards to Vault 96. All that data was going to a site they control, and it's potentially one we haven't even seen yet. Because who's been listening in on Daily Ops missions? The Enclave, with their radio interceptors. They certainly have a history of releasing dangerous species into Appalachia for research purposes, so what better way to further test these mutations than seeing them in a live setting? Monitoring our progress, and collecting that data for their own ends. Finally, a last small detail I discovered seemingly linking the Enclave and Vault 96 was this. Speaking to Orlando about ultrasound batteries, she has this to say. I might wager that whomever was behind the ultracell you discovered likely shared similar contacts with management at some point, but who can say? Now, these tubes you find in Vault 96 do look pretty similar structurally to the ones you can find in the Enclave research facility, for example. But what's very interesting is these will actually emit a hum, which you can hear quite clearly. The file name for this hum is Ultracite Battery Hum LP Loop, suggesting that these are also powered by ultracell batteries, which from my understanding aren't that common in post-war Appalachia. The AMS sites which discovered and developed the ultracite batteries were later commandeered by the Enclave, and it's the mysterious management, of course, that reward us with them after completing refuge dailies. But that wraps up today's video. I'm fairly sure, irrespective of the identity of Specimen X001, that the Enclave will be returning, if they haven't already. And with the new Mutation Invasion update on the way, I doubt we've heard the last of mutations either. But what do you think X Specimen X001 truly is? Do you think the Enclave were involved in Vault 96? Let me know what you think down in the comments. If you enjoyed this particular video, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. We consistently upload a variety of Fallout 76 content, Everything from camp build showcases, data mines, tutorials to lore videos and event guides. So turning on the bell icon is definitely the best way to stay up to date. But with that said, I'm off. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next one.